Jeff, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you doing this. Sure, Rob. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this talk. So I'm calling you Jeff now. I know you as Dr. Jeff uh, on Twitter. It's on, from Twitter spaces and everything. And so you've recently retired from being a doctor to pursue Veilshire, Veilshire full time, which is your fund. Um, what made you make that leap uh, to finally going from being a doctor and going, you, you're, you're pretty young, you know, it seems you retired a bit early. You could have been doing this a bit longer. What made you finally say, you know what, I'm going full time on this? Yeah, well, that's that's a great question. Um, so it, it it began all the way back. So I'm not that young. I'm 47. I'm, a, I'm right in the middle of Gen X. So um, it started way back when I was in college, my freshman to sophomore year. I needed to make the decision: Do I go in down the investment track or do I go down uh, the pre med track? And I chose pre med, obviously. And and once you choose pre med, your life is basically set for the next 15 years. You know exactly what you're going to do. So I've you know had four intense years in college, four years of med school, six years of residency and fellowship, uh, where I finished in uh, the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee in 2008. And then when I was done with my radiology and uh, interventional radiology fellowship, I moved with my wife and kids to Colorado Springs. About 2009, I kind of suddenly for the first time in 15 years or so had some free time and and got to be kind of interested again in, in investing because I basically literally I hadn't even thought about it for, for that long. Uh, so the first thing I did is I started a blog back when it was cool to have a blog, uh, just teaching people how to invest wisely on their own. Like you don't need a money manager. You can do this yourself. Here's, you know, here's, here are my ideas. And then uh, I quickly got picked up by the Motley Fool. And then after that, uh, Seeking Alpha started writing for them. And I was just doing kind of those little investment pieces that you see like, hey, I like this stock. Here's why you should think about buying it, those kind of things. Um, After a while of doing that, probably two to three years, I had enough of a following of people who said, hey, I like what you do. Um, would you mind managing uh, my money? And I was like, oh, I, I don't do this for a living. This is just for fun. I'm actually a doctor. Uh, but you know, it planted the seed in my head. I'm like, wow, what if I could do this for, for a living and actually kind of make a career out of it? Uh, so that planted the seed. Uh, I spent from basically 2012, 2013 devising what if I got into investing, what would I really want to do? And I decided what I want to be as a hedge fund manager because I'm kind of a maverick. I kind of like doing my own thing and not being confined to limits. What I love about the hedge fund world, it gets kind of a bad rap for lots of reasons. Um, but the cool things about hedge funds are you just have tons of freedom to do what you want to do. And so that's what I love. I get clients who trust me that I'm going to make good investment decisions and they they're just like, and I have the freedom to go anywhere. So if I think, you know, um, that it's great to be in U.S. You know, large caps this this month, I'll be in U.S. large caps. If I think that uh, Bitcoin is going to be, you know, a, a great success, we'll be in Bitcoin. And just goes anywhere around the world, whether it's gold or Malaysian equities or bonds or whatever. Um, so I started Veilshire as a side gig, founded it in 2013, started running the hedge fund in 2014 with $120,000 of my own savings and no clients. And I just turned the shingle over and said, open, let's do this. And literally had no clients for like seven months. I had no contacts. I didn't know anybody on Wall Street. Had just people uh, literally across the board said I was crazy. What are you doing? And I'm like, I just want to do this. And I think I can. So, um, so that's how it started. Uh, and then since then, it's grown to become what it's become, which is pr- which is pretty good. I have about 40 million uh, assets under management, which is still small in this world. But but you know, I'm very very humble beginning. So I'm I'm thankful for uh, for uh, uh, this opportunity. Um, so to come full circle to your question, why did I quit radiology? I've been doing both things. I've been doing Veilshire as a side gig uh, since 2014, two careers, full-time careers um, since then. It's been pretty tough on on my wife and kids. And and, and so we finally got to the point where Veilshire can support our family. And, uh, and I just love, love, love doing it. I, every Veilshire day I would look forward to. Uh, every uh, radiology day, I was kind of, I'd get some depression and, and uh, it was just, it was kind of a beat down day after day. So I was uh, really glad to have the opportunity to finally retire for good uh, from medicine, which I did back in September. And now here we are, it's just me and Veilshire and and uh, meeting people like you on Twitter and, and uh, just having a great time talking about Bitcoin and talking about investments. So having a lot of fun. What an inspiration, man. You, so you, you, with a $120,000 investment, and this is for people watching this that are in a profession that they might, they're, they might be happy in, but they could be happy somewhere else as an entrepreneur. And you literally said, you know what, I'm going to start this on my own with 120000 and then boom, 
you've turned it into as what it is now t- tens of millions of dollars in the fund now and it's only growing because you're one of the best voices in the space you're so reasonable with your approach on everything from more of a macro view um it, it's just it's an inspiration to hear that type of a story i actually didn't know that uh, about you that it started with such a low amount right there and then you turned it into what it is now i mean that's just incredible well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it's even more incredible if you know I'm a terrible salesman. I just can't stand sales, and I'm I'm I, I'd never ever ever try to um, convince anybody to invest with me or anything like that. So I just I just let the results speak for themselves. And if people want to join me in Valeshire, that's fantastic. And if they don't, that's equally fantastic. I don't care. Uh, so I'm very thankful to have been able to been this successful at this point, uh, given that I have basically no sales funnel at all. It's totally awesome, man. Uh, to, to, this will be a little bit, it's kind of not, we, we're going to talk a lot, obviously about Bitcoin, but I'm as a doctor, I'm kind of curious because I'm, I'm kind of a health nut myself. Like what did you find the most overlooked in the health space? Like from people that you'd find, like what, what do you think is the most overlooked thing in health? Is it the amount of water we drink is it the type of diet that most of us are eating is it, what, in, in your experience in the medical field, what, what's most overlooked? Sure. So first of all, I should say a caveat to everything. Like this is just my personal opinion. I don't mean to ream on the traditional healthcare system because that's where I came from. And that's the, you know why I'm here today. I have lots of great friends, lots of great colleagues still in traditional healthcare. It's, it's, it's great. But, um, and you know this because we've been in rooms together talking about healthcare a little bit. I think the traditional healthcare system is very bloated, stodgy, inefficient, has lots of room for improvement, and that's coming uh, in the coming years uh, and decades, thankfully. Uh, and I think it's tied into Bitcoin, but we can get uh, talk about that later. Most overlooked healthcare, like um, healthy living thing that people don't think about in traditional healthcare, I think is is honestly nutrition. When I was in med school, I think I got maybe a couple hours worth of nutrition um, teaching, and then that was it. And we looked at studies that were basically um, from the 50s and 60s where conclusions were drawn, and they weren't actually great studies that were done at the time. Uh, But basically what that became was the foundation for the huge fiat agriculture system that we live on currently. So, you know, processed foods, vegetable oils. Um, you know, Coke and Diet Coke and these McDonald's diets that it's transformed Americans from being a super healthy society to just massively overweight and obese and just incredibly unhealthy. Everybody has diabetes or pre-diabetes, not everybody, but a huge uh, majority of people do. Um, it's a, it's, it's an academic, it's an absolute epidemic. The obesity epidemic is. And so, um, If I could do one thing and if I were in charge for a day, the first thing I would do is just start teaching people about actual nutrition and the importance of what you put into your body and how everything that we think we knew was probably wrong uh, and getting back to the basics. And it's actually pretty easy, um, but most people don't want to hear it. They want to know, like, give me a pill that can make me thin. How can I, you know, eat McDonald's and still look good? How, how can I, how can I have muscles without working out? You know, I mean, they, they, Americans, it's just so sad. It's that fiat brain thinking, like, I just want to do the easiest thing possible and make no sacrifices, but yet I want to have this proof of work body and I want to live to be a hundred and it just doesn't happen. It's incompatible. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, I, I was curious your thoughts on this because I, I've been doing this intermittent fasting thing and drinking more water during the day and eating one big meal around like three, four o'clock and no processed anything. Just I, I was on the carnivore diet for a long time. I still kind of am ish on the carnivore diet. I'll have avocados and stuff like that. I'll make some other stuff in there, too. But like what what did you th- after kind of seeing all the different things in the medicine field, like what? do you see being the, the diet that makes the most sense to you right now? And this is just, just our opinion, by the way. Sure. I mean, sure. Yeah. Not, not, in, not individual health advice either, yeah. <laughs> but, but I do think, um, uh, I do think I, I'm a big fan of steak. Okay. So this, so getting to know me, I was in 2015, that was when I was doing, um, uh, radiology and interventional radiology. I was on call every fourth night and I was running Valeshire on the side. I was just super, super, super busy. Jeez, and I do drank, it, man. Oh man, I drank tons of coffee and I ate junk food all the time and I gained like 30 pounds. And so I finally hit a weight for me that I just thought was, this is just obnoxious. Like I'm so overweight. I'm getting just, I'm so out of shape. I'm tired all the time. So I I wanted to do something. So I did a lot of reading at the time and I went, I chose to go vegan. And so my wife and I, and and my kids reluctantly kind of went down the mostly vegan path. Uh, We kind of started hardcore at first and, and it lightened up over time, but 
the first two months was phenomenal. I lost tons of weight right away. Um, I felt great. I went down a couple like clothes sizes and everything and, and felt awesome. And I'm like, well, this is great. So I kept that actually up for about five years kind of off and on. And, and, um, I mean, we're getting way off track right now, but, but I started is, having no, the Bitcoiners love this. You gotta okay, have a okay. good, if you have to have a good body and a good brain to make good <laughs> investment decisions and to be doing the, and store your, your Bitcoin, right. And all these different things. So this, this is a, this is actually something I think a lot of people want. It's, it's funny. I'm seeing that cross Bitcoiners tend to really be into health. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what, that's part of what I enjoy so much about it. It's just such an awesome community because, and I think to your point, what we're looking for is the truth. Like, I don't care what everybody says. I don't care that this doctor says this. I don't care that that politician says that. What is true, you know? And so that's what leads us to Bitcoin as the truest sound money. And then that that's what also leads us to what? how do you actually be healthy? Like something's obviously wrong in America, right? You don't have two thirds of the population be obese or overweight and say that, that this is a good system. Are you kidding me? It's insane. Um, and I, I go off on, be, way before Bitcoin, I used to go off on this on Twitter all the time. I used to have this other healthcare kind of account and I would talk about this because, uh, you know, people make fun of the U.S. for spending so much money on health care, but having generally poor results. We kind of have mediocre, like longevity results. It's because we have the world's most unhealthy population. Like we are so, so unhealthy. There are a few of us like you and other people in the Bitcoin space and, and people out of the Bitcoin space who are very healthy, who get it. They exercise, they eat well, they're smart. Um, um, but that's not, I'm not talking about them. We have a wildly unhealthy population and it's really hard to keep really unhealthy people alive. And, and if you have diabetes and you're morbidly obese and you have heart conditions and your blood vessels are full of plaque, uh, you know, and you're more likely to get cancer and you have inflammation throughout your system, you're going to die sooner. That's just how it works. It doesn't matter if you have the best healthcare system in the world. So anyways, that's another digression. So, getting back, back to the diet to, to oh, the vegan thing because like i actually tried being vegan myself and it gave me terrible stomach aches i got like a rash and i like i, I decided i'm like you know what I, I i tried it for like a month and a half and it didn't work for me and then i went to just like going pretty much not every, anything and everything went but i just started taking out carbs and started going more towards a fatty diet and started going mm -hmm. okay well avocados have a lot of great fats and okay i'll eat a lot of avocado okay well I, i'll eat a steak here and maybe maybe i'm eating too much maybe i just need to eat one big meal and have a lot of water maybe i'm 80 percent water as a human you know and really we're not drinking enough good pure water and that that was the missing link because i mean the, the, our brain is like 90 percent h2o and we're not drinking enough water drinking soda pop and all this stuff and so i was curious like because you actually did that same thing so what, what was that when you're talking about being a vegan then tr going from vegan i think you tried the car you're on the corner of our diet or yeah. i remember you posting something about that so i'm curious how that transition works so you you and your family went vegan it didn't you, you kind of went hardcore at first if you could pick up back back there okay so pick, yeah so so we'll get back there sorry i, I go on rabbit trails all the time no so, i love it man so, i love it so so we're vegan i was feeling pretty good and then we were just kind of continuing on with that for years you're smart enough you got out uh, a month and a half into it I kept it up for years. And then I started one by one, started noticing a lot of symptoms. First of all, I got really weak. I, I got to the point where I literally, I couldn't do two pull-ups in a row. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so weak. I could barely do push-ups anymore. I tried swinging kettlebells and I about had a heart attack. Like, okay, so that's one thing. My skin got super dry. I was just dry and cracked all the time. My fingernails, I would play this thing called ultimate Frisbee. If you know what that is, it's kind of like flag football mixed with Frisbee. Uh, in soccer, you run around, you know, whatever. I, if the Frisbee hit my fingernails, it would literally chip my fingernails off. They would break off in chunks. And I'm like, well, that's weird. My bones were breaking. I broke like four or five fingers over a four year period. Um, belly pain stuff you're talking about, constant belly pain. Um, um, oh, and then the thing that really put me over the edge, anxiety and depression. I, I struggled with for the first time ever in my life. I, I actually went for like a year with like almost like borderline major depression. Like I would lay in bed and stare at the wall for four hours a day um, uh, during the day instead of working uh, or when I had my days off. And, and it got, it, I got to be almost dysfunctional uh, for a while. And I'm like, okay, something is crazy. And that's just the, the things I can uh, think of right now. Um, but those were the main symptoms. And, 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 and it wasn't until um, I was reading, uh, no, let's see, I saw Joe Rogan, a podcast, Joe Rogan interviewed a dude who wrote The Carnivore Diet. Um, and I can't remember, he's another physician. Uh, I have him up on my bookshelf. I know there. exactly who you're talking about. The Carnivore about. Code, I think it's I, called. I, I believe you're right. And then, I, then also he was talking with like Jordan Peterson was the one that made me really take the leap. Him and his daughter's story about it was what I heard from Joe Rogan's podcast. And, and I was like, wow, that's interesting. And 
that, so I, I don't, I don't, I want you to keep going with this. No, so. so yeah, 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 yeah. No spoilers here. So, so anyway, so I, I, I got his book and I read it from cover to cover. I thought I, I, you know, I always, like any book I disagreed with a little bit, but then the general premise though, I was like, this is mind blowing. And what it, and the things that were mind blowing is he was a physician. I'm a physician. He went back through the same studies that we spent two hours on in med school and reviewed them and said, this is why the conclusions we drew from these studies were incorrect. And they led America down this stupid food pyramid schedule and the fiat food and the mass agriculture and all this kind of, you know, processed foods. And it should not have done that. It basically made an enemy of red meat, uh, steak in particular, uh, and that was not the right conclusion. And so, and then it kind of, and then the book talks about here are why, here are the many benefits of that. Um, so, anyways, I read that, got pretty fired up, and I'm like, well, maybe that's part of my problem. So I started, I introduced steak back into my diet for the first time in like five years. I'm telling you, Rob, within like three days everything improved. Like my depression and anxiety were gone. I went from doing, you know, one and a half push-ups or pull-ups. This won't impress you because I know you're totally buff, but like I can, now I can do, you know, 10 to 12 in a row, no problem. Um, you know, swinging kettlebells, hundreds of push-ups a day, like stuff that I, I couldn't even dream of doing because I was so weak. I, oh, I was like cold and tall. I was always cold. I felt like this like 80 year old man. I was always cold. I was wearing like jackets in the, in the summer and my family was always making fun of me. Um, that went away right away. I mean, even like bowel movements got just a hundred times better. Like, I, like thing after thing after thing improved. I, I felt just alive again. Uh, our marriage improved, you know, like I became like the old me again, uh, which was really fun. And my personality came back. So it, I'm not saying it's totally because of red meat, but I s certainly think there's a lot of evidence that points down that way. It's hard to disagree with that. Um, and it's, it's it basically what the book was talking about would happen was exactly what did happen with me. And I'm so I'm kind of a living case study of that. So I'm not pure carnivore. And getting back again to your question, what what do I think? But I think that you have to have steak as part of your diet. I have a daughter who gets anemic really easily. And if she goes two days without eating beef or steak, she gets just really weak and, you know, and, and she has a lot of symptoms. She feels like she's going to faint and she'll just do that. And within, you know, uh, a couple hours, she just feels much better. And so, so you, it's across our family, at least it's, it's been by far the most significant thing that we've done. And I'm, I'm actually really thankful for it. Well, it's huge to hear this from somebody who was been, a, how, how long were you, how, were you a practicing physician, physician for in, in the radio? Since, well, I, since I got out of, so I, I was an MD since out of med school in 2002 and then I did my residency. So you're technically a doctor, but you're in training. Uh, 2008 is when I got out of my training officially. So uh, 2008 until 2021, 13 years. So to hear you not just speaking about it, but also being a case study on it as well is just huge. And I'm sure a lot of people listening, because it's, it's funny because like in, in the in the Bitcoin space and in, in the community on Twitter, it's like you see this thing where it's like this, the seed oils are the enemy. Seed oils are like an altcoin, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, watch out for those and watch out for carbs yeah. and this, this and that. And it's like proof of stake is like the thing. It's like, it's, it's hilarious to see that. It's like, that's, this is our proof of stake, you know, it's yeah, right. totally different, you know, it's a. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I've I've had the same situation happen with me where it's like when I I I only I can only do it for about a month and a half, and then I was like off and on trying to do it, and I I, I can still have greens here and there, and I I don't I don't mind them, but it's like if I took meat out of my diet, I I don't know. I I think I just I think there's something has to do with the red meat and testosterone probably or something like that mm -hmm. with a man in it. So yeah, so it's just it's crazy to hear that from you and your experience with it and all the different things that it helped you. And uh, I think that a lot of people watching this actually really benefit from that. And it's funny that you saw, saw the same interviews that I did and kind of made you go, I'm going to try this thing out. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that's what I tell people in the audience to consider if this is something that interests you. A lot of the studies that kind of um, talk about how bad red meat is. And I, I used to be a doctor who would tell my own patients because I dealt as an interventional radiologist, I was always putting catheters in people's veins and arteries and things. So I'm, I'm telling you, as a guy who was a supposed expert in this space, I would tell people avoid red meat, avoid red meat. And I think that red meat was completely maligned in a lot of these studies. And it was lumped in with things like, well, they're eating McDonald's, you know, Big Macs plus fries plus a Coke. Therefore, red meat is bad because look at the symptoms they're having. And, and I think it was sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and so it got a bad rap. And I, I, if you relook at the data with a critical eye, you'll come to a completely different conclusion, I think. 
so crazy. So, you know, it's like the, it's just that thing we're all told. It's, it, it's like everything we're told could possibly be a lie and we need to find this information on our own now. And the internet mm-hmm. is helping us do that. The internet is like yeah. this useful tool where it's like the real information isn't in the old textbooks. The real information is online on YouTube and talking to guys like you and watching, you know, podcasts and different things. That's where we're getting our real information. And that's how we're finding things like Bitcoin. So uh, I guess we could finally start talking a bit about more finance stuff. I just, I, I think as a doctor, it's so, it's so rare to get somebody who was a doctor for that, for as long as you have been, who recently decided it's like to say retired. I don't know if you're retired. You just decided to be an entrepreneur. So you, you went to Veilshire full time now and to, to not go into the medicine a little bit, I feel like I would be missing a, a great part about you, you know? So it's sure, great yeah. to hear how much you know about health and how you're actually doing that for your, your own health and for your kids' health and your family. Um, so to, to get towards Bitcoin, um, what when you first started Veilshar, was Bitcoin on your radar right away? Or like what was your first kind of places? Was it more uh, value plays or what was the, the play at the beginning? Sure. So I started as basically a dyed in the wool value investor. So I was a value investor in the training of Warren Buffett and, and that whole uh, school of thought uh, and in the healthcare system. So I was like basically a, a healthcare value investor. Um, didn't hadn't even heard of Bitcoin. If I had, I don't remember it. The first time I came across Bitcoin was, I think, towards the end of 2016. That's when I um, got drawn into the whole crypto space. And I and I and I I say crypto um, intentionally. So I, I didn't know what I, I didn't know what Bitcoin was. I just knew there's this kind of whole new world of assets, digital assets that have incredible um, returns and they're just just crushing the stock market. And so at least as an investor, I need to start taking a look at this and, and see what's going on. So originally this is outside of Veilshire. I didn't have any Veilshire investments in here. Personally, I bought, you know, I was, I was kind of a wealthy doctor who kind of knew a little bit about that. It's the same story I see with people today who are sort of dipping into the whole crypto space. They have money to burn. They seeing their friends make a thousand percent in Doge and ten thousand percent in Shiba Inu, and other doggy coins and other garbage. And they're like, I gotta get in on this. So I put a hundred bucks here and two hundred bucks there. And I and at, way back in 2016 and 2017, I owned a ton. Of, I owned a ton of Ethereum, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum Classic, all of those old things that were part of the fork wars. And I, I was watching the fork wars just sort of peripherally, still had no idea, had no idea who was going to win. So my th- my thinking back then um, was, well, I'm just going to dabble in a lot of these things and have a diversified portfolio and and it should take care of itself. And for a while, I felt like a genius, right? If, if you were around back in 2017, everything just went up, 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 up. I used to get up at two in the morning to check my portfolio and be like, oh my gosh, we went up another 3X last night. You know, it's just incredible. And, um, and I, and I was the kind of guy that was like, well, it, it makes sense that if Bitcoin is gold, then um, then Litecoin is silver. So I should buy a bunch of Litecoin. And so by the end of 2017, and I like to share this story because this is what I see people doing today. By the end of 2017, I had sold all of my Bitcoin and Ethereum actually and got totally sucked into all this everything else. And um, so I own just tons of all of these other things and, and like 30 other things that I can't remember half of them anymore because they don't even exist anymore or they're almost, you know, worth zero. Then came the crash in 2018. So I took some profits in 2017, took them in early 2018, got hit with a gigantic tax bill in 2018. And in the end, I had, I don't know, maybe doubled the small amount of money that I, relatively small amount of money that I had invested and um, had no Bitcoin left and was like, well, that was fun. That was weird and didn't think much more of it. So that was 2018. 2019, I noticed that Bitcoin was still sticking around. And that was when I think Saifedean's book came out and when um, Plan B came out with his stock to flow model. And I and so I got back into it. And the other thing I want to give props to Preston Pish. Preston Pish, so I was a value investor. I used to listen to his um, uh, TIP podcast and We Study Billionaires podcast because he was a value investor as well. And he got then into Bitcoin and he would share that publicly. Hey, here's what I'm thinking. And everybody used to laugh at him. And then over time, they kept, you know, they kept talking about it more and more. And so I did as well. So I like to tell people I'm, I'm originally the class of 2016 with Bitcoin. But I didn't go down the rabbit hole until 2019. So I got held back three years, started over in 2019, went down the rabbit hole, did the, I mean, I've done 20,000 or more hours of studying on on Bitcoin since then. And I'm just like totally, totally orange pilled, total Bitcoin fanatic now. 
that was the time where, our, so starting in 2019, I started teaching my Veilshire clients about it. We used to have no allocation to it. Uh, and that's where I got my clients off of 0% to like a 1% allocation in our portfolios. And I had tons of pushback from my clients at the time. And then so it, what, what was fun about being an RIA, an investment advisor at that time, what I could do is I could show my clients, I could be, look, here are the clients who have exactly the same portfolio, but this, this set of clients has 1% Bitcoin. Look at that. Even that little bit has made this much of a difference and we're that much higher and the volatility basically isn't any any different either. And so I would I would kind of teach them and these risk adjusted returns, the sharp ratio is out of this world. Like you guys, we have to have at least some exposure, even if you don't like it. I'm telling you, I trust it. So trust if you trust me, let me put you at least in a little bit of that. So over time and over teaching. We got off zero, we got to 1%, and then that grew to 5%, and then 10%, and then and then we have some clients, depending on who they are, they're up to 40, 50% Bitcoin in portfolios, which is re really high, especially for, for, our, for the RIA world. I think the last time I heard um, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, I think only 9% of RIAs have their clients in, in, in Bitcoin currently, and the ones that do, it's like 1%, like 1% to 2%. So we're, we're way ahead of the curve on that, uh, which I'm thankful for because I just have clients who trust my judgment and, and have been okay with this allocation from you know back in 2019. So that's how I got into it. The risk adjusted returns, I was really foolish in the beginning. I took the time to go down the rabbit hole in 2019 and I haven't looked back since. I, I look at it now like Bitcoin is just the greatest asset of our species, probably. It's a once in a species type asset. And if you can ride the coattails of something that's this incredible, to me it's like if you could ride the coattails of the internet, um, uh, you, you can't help but to succeed. And so I basically pinned Veilshire onto that as far as like, we are going to ride Bitcoin and I'm going to go unabashedly into Bitcoin and talk about it unabashedly. Um, and um, for better and for worse. So during the, the bear markets, I get hammered and people make fun of me and I lose clients even. And I'm like, I, I get it. I try, you know, I, I said, but I still believe in this. And I think this story is going to go for decades and centuries. And I think we are in the right place in the right time. And so, um, uh, that's, I have a lot of the success of Veilshire owes to, owes to Bitcoin. I'll that's stop there. I, I love chatting with you because you're the captain of your ship. You know, you're the captain. And so what you say goes, and that's what you wanted. You didn't mm -hmm. want to, to take orders from anybody. You wanted to be in control of it and you have your, and, and not be, not have somebody else trying to change your mindset on it. There's so many people that are just, you know, a, a manager or something like that, that, that have to have orders from somebody else. And they can't make these kind of unilateral decisions where you just go like, I'm going in this direction. This is where I'm going. Right. Uh, so it's, it's amazing to hear from somebody like you and why you got so big on Bitcoin and, and how much time you've put into Bitcoin. What would you say is like the best argument that you've given to somebody that wants that you're trying to get them off zero to accept some of it in their portfolio, so to speak? Like, so the best thing I heard so far was when uh, Greg Foss, like, because everybody wants to just bash on Peter Schiff, including myself. Right. But Jeff, I mean, uh, Greg, Ro Greg, Greg Foss, Greg not, Foss sorry, yeah, Greg, yeah. Jeff Ross, Greg, <laughs> yeah. co co tongue twister. But um, so Greg Foss was on. He goes, he's a terrible risk manager. It was an opportunity to have a small percent of your portfolio in Bitcoin as an in, as an insurance play. So if he didn't, he could have been the best gold fund manager in the country if he had just put a small position in Bitcoin in the off chance that it is correct. And that's what you heard Ch Chamath talking about on CNBC. And that's when I got in. And I literally made a video saying Peter Schiff is wrong about Bitcoin because that's what I did. I went and put up, I actually put about a 5, 10% position in Bitcoin back then. And that was maybe 11, 12 months ago, something like that, when I made mm -hmm. the, the video saying Peter Schiff is wrong. And he went and commented on that video, which inspired me to continue going with the channel. <laughs> he was like, oh, at, at, the end, at the end, I hope uh, your channel does better than Bitcoin. And it was like, that was my head, like a thousand subscribers. And, and <laughs> like, I was just a time, I'm like, how did you have the find, how do you have the time of day to find this video, Peter? Like, <laughs> anyway, but uh, what, what do you think is like the best line to tell somebody to get them off zero? They might be, I have a lot of precious metals individuals. Like I made a video talking about like how much silver, like how much silver is one Bitcoin and it kind of is staggering how much silver is now one Bitcoin at 62. I think I made the video was at 62.5. And I said, you know, at the end of the video, I'm like, if you put a comment down below, do you have some Bitcoin? Do you have a little, like what, what's your allocation? And a lot of people still go, I'm only in precious metals. I don't trust it. It's all these things. So what do you say to that individual? Like, how sure. Well, so it depends who I'm talking to. And I know you know that too. It, it depends what point of view they're coming from. So I try to 
uh, qualify my, my message to them. So if I'm talking to my Valeshire clients, those people who are interested in investing and, and are all about the traditional, you know, portfolio management, all these kind of things, diversification, all these things we learned in the whole fiat system. What I tell them is, look, the risk adjusted returns of Bitcoin are just simply off the charts. Like it's, it's actually um, foolish to not have at least a little bit of Bitcoin. If you're concerned about the volatility of Bitcoin, I get that. Um, but so then for people like you, we just need to keep your position sizes small because even a small position of a very volatile asset can, can do wonders for your portfolio. What's cool about Bitcoin's volatility, as we know, it's more volatile to the upside than to the downside. So it's basically foolish not to have at least a little bit in it. And what makes it easy for me, again, as a, as a fund manager and as an RIA, is I can literally just show people, here's my clients on Bitcoin, here's my clients that are not on Bitcoin. Look at the difference. And it's a sizable difference. And I'm like, the only thing different in these portfolios is the amount of Bitcoin. It's either no Bitcoin or a lot of, you know, or some portion of Bitcoin. That's what I tell them. And then what I just tell the general, most of the general public, I usually go down the route of, it's just simply better money. And, and then I'll go, I'll talk about inflation. And uh, you know, for, even for people who don't get finance and don't have real mathematical minds, I'm like, well, do you notice that life gets more expensive year after year? And I, like, isn't that weird? Like, do you ever wonder why? Yeah. And, you know, I'm 47. I still remember as a kid in the 80s, you could go to a vending machine and Snickers bars were 15 cents or 25 cents. That another two bucks, you know, or buck 50 or something like that. And the Coke is the same. It was a quarter or something. And now it's two bucks. And, and so, you know, that's, that's called inflation. Like, do you ever, do you ever wonder why it is that it does that? And like, well, yeah, okay. You know, that seems kind of weird. I'm like, that's just called inflation. So the government is actively debasing our money. They're taking our purchasing power away, which just means that the longer you hold on to the US dollar, the more expensive life gets. I said, Bitcoin was created as basically the solution to that. It's exactly the opposite of that. It turns it on its head. The longer you hold Bitcoin, the cheaper life gets. And that's because it actually increases your purchasing power over time. You know, and I'll get into that, how it's just math. If you can print something to infinity, then the value of each individual unit goes down to zero. That's what fiat currency is. If you can, uh, if something is perfectly scarce, um, the value of each individual unit is going to approach infinity over time. It's just math. Um, so you can basically guarantee mathematically that your, your Bitcoin will go up in value and your U.S. dollar will go down in value. So which one would you rather hold? And people kind of get that after a while, and that usually gets them off zero. And then, you, you know, as you know, once you get off zero, it's, it's just this ascension where you're like, well, if, I'm, if I have 1% and it's just doing so well, why wouldn't I have 5% in there? Why wouldn't I put 10%? Why wouldn't I DCA into it on a regular basis and start to convert my savings over? And pretty soon you turn people in from skeptics to uh, speculators. I think that's phase two to investors is phase three. And then eventually phase four and the final phase is you think of Bitcoin. It's just savings. It's just savings technology. And so all you have to do is sit and hold your Bitcoin. And that's really about it. And then you can move on with the rest of your life. I totally agree with that. That's a, that is a great way to put it. Um, one of the things that, that I noticed is once I, once I started once I bought Bitcoin, I got off zero and I had a small allocation of my, I called it like my decentralized portfolio, which is all metals. Well, pretty much my entire portfolio is decentralized now at this point. I don't really have anything except MicroStrategy stock is the only thing. And that's something I also want to talk about because you were in MicroStrategy very early. Um, it was once I had skin in the game and then I had something to protect because it went up so much. Now I'm like, okay, I actually really need to learn about this. You know, it's like, cause I, I guess it, that's kind of um, the selfish thing about it. It's like, I wanted to learn, but I didn't really want to learn until there was real skin in the game and I had something to lose. And so then I went into learning about cold storage and going, okay, what's this? And because I come from precious metals with mineral exchange, you know, I went, okay, well, let me try this. Let me send a hundred bucks off of the exchange, off of this cash app here and put it into this little device that I bought from, from Trezor was the first one that I got was that Trezor model T. And I saw that I got a soft confirmation like right away. And I'm like, wait a minute. So you mean to tell me, it tells me immediately the second it, I send it, I get a, I get a soft confirmation and know it's on the blockchain pending to get into there. So it's not like a wire transfer. I have to sit around running around my warehouse, hoping, please God, the wire needs to land. I need that 50 grand. <laughs> please God. Like you're always wait, you're always waiting and hoping that this wire is going to land. And sometimes it lands a little late or something, or maybe it's even the next day or you just don't know. It's totally up in the air when you send it. Sometimes it's immediately depending on if it's like they're a high end client at the bank or whatever. And so it, it the, the fed wire system also like it dropped 
Uh, recently, it just went off. The, they said it was it was down for a day, and it's like, well, that doesn't happen with the Bitcoin network. And so, I guess what I was trying to t- rather than, uh, sorry, I get a little bit off track, but it, but when I sent it off, when I sent it off the exchange, put it in cold storage, that's when I realized the actual utility of Bitcoin and how easy it was to custody it, and it kind of made it tangible when I did that, and it changed mm-hmm. my whole perspective of it. Like, how how do you feel about um, like more more people learning about? actually understanding how it works and, and taking advantage of that. Because if we do get to a hyper Bitcoinized world, we're going to need to understand how these wallets work, how the lightning network works, how all of these things work. Because a lot of people haven't even, don't even understand that you can walk into a Starbucks or a McDonald's in El Salvador right now and buy your, your food or your coffee with Satoshis. So it's like, um, I guess, I guess the real question that I want to ask is like, how do you feel about funds starting to use cold storage to actually have spot Bitcoin in the fund itself. Are you thinking about that with Veilshire or like, how, how do you feel about sure. that approach towards it? Sure. Sure. So I have a couple different thoughts and, and, and first of all, I'll say that I completely agree with the um, importance of cold storage with the uh, importance of taking responsibility and ownership of your Bitcoin um, with the whole ethos of Bitcoin is the people's money is decentralized. It's not controlled by institutions. I love all of that. And I love that ethos. What I think is going to happen though, is different than that. So, so I think that 10 years from now, we are going to be seen as sort of like the pioneers of the internet were in the late eighties and early nineties, where these guys actually understood how the internet works. They understand the need for, um, routers and switches and why Cisco is important and, and TTP IP and, and, you know, these protocols that, um, like I don't know anything about now. I know how to use the internet and I understand conceptually what it is, but I just use it because it's convenient. You know, I, I couldn't assemble the internet by myself if I had to, like say the world blows up and I'm, it's just me left and I have to rebuild the internet. I would literally have no idea what to do. Right. Those of us that are, I think we are the last of the early pioneers of Bitcoin. Um, And again, this is contrary to what most of the Bitcoin ethos system uh, is about. So so I apologize. And and this isn't meant to be offensive. It's just what I think is going to happen. I think that there are those of us who really, really, really understand Bitcoin. And there are people who are way smarter than I am and who are more technical and they understand the coding behind it and, you know, all the software behind it. I think the next generation of Bitcoiners are going to be people who just use it because all it is is better money. And they're going to use the Lightning Network because it's just super easy to use and it's going to be super convenient. And they're going to be like, why would I use a Visa card that charges 3% on top of this transaction when I could just do Lightning for free or just for a very, very, very small, uh, a very small fee? Um, It's instantaneous. I can move a a dollar or or a penny or a billion dollars if I want to instantly right now across the world. Um, I can support friends in, you know, Africa right now instantly if I want to. Um, And I think that that's what it's going to um, morph into is just tons and tons of people. It's going to become ubiquitous. And the vast majority of people are not going to hold Bitcoin uh, on in cold storage. Um, and they're not going to do self custody, even though I think that's fantastic and people should do that. I think those of us that do are going to be in the very, very, very small minority. I'm a little concerned from a political perspective that politicians are going to try to block the original pioneers out and basically be like, you can do that, but you can only have this sort of black market exchange of your Bitcoin if you want to, but you're not going to be allowed to do it on exchanges unless you declare it. You know, we're going to tax the the crap out of you. Uh, We're going to figure out some way to get access to it. I think that's going to be a point of contention going into the future. And so that's a long way around to say, I very much believe in that for my fund um, cause that's, that was your question. Currently I have mostly, most of my Bitcoin is just in, um, grayscale GBTC, um, because it's selling at a discount to NAV. Once that NAV disappears, once there are spot price ETFs, which I think will happen at the longest three years from now could happen as soon as Christmas Eve. Um, once that happens, then I'll start looking into doing self or fund custody of the Bitcoin, um, because then it, I won't have the discount to NAV anymore. So, does that all make sense? Yeah. Um, so, so, I, so I think because we're the early pioneers and we get it more and we're more into like, what is the philosophy of Bitcoin and what is the ethos? We are fans of self-custody and, and self-sovereignty. The next generation of people, I don't think are going to be like that. It's going to be, you know, the boomers coming in and just like, hey, I just want to make way better returns. And the people who just start using it as basically the, the, the transaction railway for all of our uh, day-to-day 
e-commerce basically. Yeah, it's fascinating to think how it's going to play out. Um, I, for for me, it was like the the learning curve with cold storage at first was a little bit high, and then when I learned it, now I'm to the point where I have my own node validating my own Bitcoin and my own cold storage, and I'm doing all of that stuff. And um, it just gets more and more fascinating to me because I guess like because one of my biggest concerns from precious metals is like SLV ETF, for example, is a silver ETF. Mm -hmm. If you do the digging onto that ETF, you find out that it's JP Morgan who actually is the custodian of the silver for that ETF. So the silver that is in their vaults, it's in JP Morgan's vaults. And Mm -hmm. then on top of it, when you read the fine print, it says we can sell the silver for management expenses and like things like this. There's all these little loopholes and stuff for them. Mm -hmm. And then not only that, but JP Morgan is the one that's been caught for multiple felony accounts of manipulation right. of precious, precious metals and settled outside of court. So obviously they were, were uh, just my opinion, guilty in some way because they settled. So uh, it's it's crazy to think about that, that they're in control of this ETF. Now this ETF that just rolled out, what a lot of people don't understand is this is a futures ETF. This isn't a spot ETF. So it, although it's good for Wall Street, it's people like are going to see it on CNBC and all this stuff and it's going to get news and, and the people are going to it's going to open the doors for more investors and, and more funds to go, OK, look, we can get into this now because there's an ETF. It, it, it brings it more to the real world for them. Um, how do you feel about this futures ETF? Does it change anything for you? Um, or do you want to see the, the spot ETF roll out and you're waiting until the spot ETF rolls out to get into that? Uh, so right now you're basically in grayscale due to it trading at a discount. But once that does change, how do you see these ETFs? Sure. So the, the futures ETF, I think, is a uh, it was an inevitable product. I think it's a terrible thing for basically anybody to own. I think traders can use it and uh, for their own long, short purposes. Um, for the individual investor, I think they should stay away from it. It, it doesn't really provide any benefit. It's, it's almost guaranteed to underperform, basically, you know, for sure underperform just straight up Bitcoin, it's going to underperform a spot uh, Bitcoin ETF. It's going to underperform a grayscale type product, uh, a closed end fund. So it's 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 kind of the worst of of all the options. Some people, for some people, maybe it's the only option. I don't really believe that though, because you could invest in MicroStrategy, you can invest in other kind of proxies uh, to get access to Bitcoin. I think that the financialization of Bitcoin is absolutely inevitable, right? Wall Street wants their piece of the cake and they're going to get it. And so this is just one of the things that they're doing. It's it's they created this this ETF. I think the spot price ETFs are another way they're going to get because they're going to get their fees. They're going to, you know, it just kind of stuff you're talking about. JP Morgan wants in. They want to charge for their custodianship. They want to make it uh, put little loopholes in there so that if you want to try to claim any Bitcoin, sure, but it's really going to be inconvenient for you. And we're going to get more fees on top of that if you do that. It will bring in way more money into the Bitcoin ecosystem. So if you're just simply a hodler, which most of us are, it's going to be beneficial from a monetary standpoint. But this is kind of what I'm getting at. So so financially, it's going to be great for those of us who just hold and especially for those who just have it on, you know, in cold storage and you're just sitting on it doing nothing for the long term. It's going to be frustrating, though, to watch because the original, you know, all of, again, the ethos of Bitcoin, why did we create this? We want to get it away from these institutions. It's decentralized. We don't want Wall Street to profit. We want the little guy to succeed and to, for them, we want the El Salvadorans to increase their purchasing power just by saving in Bitcoin. And I think that will still happen, um, but it's kind of bastardized, right? And, it, and it, it's sort of frustrating to watch, but I think it's inevitable. So personally, this is just how I am. I'm really pragmatic. I, I, I just, I know that it's coming. I don't like that it's coming. I think we should resist it in a lot of ways, but I do think it's inevitable. Um, and so I try to think, well, what's the, what's the silver lining to this? What's the silver lining to the financialization of Bitcoin? Well, we can make a lot of profits. I can bring as much people into Bitcoin as possible through Valeshire and get them on board in this new system. I can teach them about it. So they realize that it's much better money, much sounder money than the current government fiat stuff that we use. Um, and that's sort of my way of like doing good in this world. That's going to get increasingly more chaotic and darker, if that makes sense. Yeah, you another know, long-winded it's, answer. That's no, it's 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 what it's what people need to hear, and it's um what I, what I'm curious about when you say like heading towards kind of a dark situation. What I get so worried about with the stock market is this funnel type thing, and when I say funnel, I mean 
I'm trusting that TD Ameritrade owns th this stock for me or some exchange owns or broker owns this stock for me. And then I'm hoping that they, their app works. This is like what goes through my mind. It's like, if I want to sell, I hope that that, that thinkorswim is working on my phone and works on my computer. If it's down, then I hope that they're going to answer the phone line. If their phone line's down, then I don't know what happens in that scenario there because I have to use them to sell it. I don't actually have it in my, I can't take my Apple stock or my Tesla stock or even my MicroStrategy, put it in my pocket and have it on like a cold storage device or something like that where I have full access to it. I have to trust their system and their protocol. Then I have to hope that they can send it from their, they're solvent enough to send it to the bank. And then I have to trust that the bank is solvent enough and has the doors open and their app works and their phone lines work as well to get me the money into my pocket. And then I have to trust on top of all of that, that the money itself, it's solvent, you know? So it's like, is the money like, so there's this huge trust funnel. I like to call it, I, I, I call it this, the trust funnel. And it's like, that scares me so much with this, the stock market. And the only thing that, that I think in my mind that can save the stock market is if more and more companies do what MicroStrategy did and convert its balance sheet to Bitcoin, uh, because that might actually save it if we're at the current situation that we're in. Like, how, how do you see this playing out? Are we in, because I said, I brought up the idea of stagflation to Greg uh, Foss on our interview, and he goes, we're already there. We're in stagflation right now. So it's like, it almost seems like a perfect case scenario for an asset like Bitcoin to really start getting a cushion here in a stagflation environment. Like, how do you see this environment in the stock market? And how do you see it kind of playing out in the next five year horizon here? Sure. So you brought up a lot of good questions and good points here. So coming to your idea of the funnel, the dreaded funnel of trust that's coming, I think that's coming for Bitcoin also. But I think that what's very different about Bitcoin is the base layer of Bitcoin, as you know, is it's like perfect money. It's decentralized. It's totally secure. It's totally trustless. And so they're going to build these things that require trust on top of that. And all of humanity, most of humanity, I should say, it will gladly trade um, a little bit of that, you know, for more security and for more convenience, right? They, 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 they'll give up the self-custody and the freedom that that brings in order to have it be, well, I can just click do this on my phone, right? We're already seeing the Lightning Network, which is awesome. I love everything about the Lightning Network. But even that now introduces trust, right? I have a Strike app. I have the Moon Wallet. If I want to send things, I have to trust that Jack Mueller's made Strike app so it's going to work and do what I say it's going to do. If I say I'm going to scan this code that it's for sure going to go here and I have to trust that Strike isn't doing anything in the middle, that's, you know, I trust him totally and I own it and I use it a lot. But we already have a layer of trust built on there now. And it's going to just get more and more like that where we're and so we, again, we're the original pioneer. We're the last of the pioneers. We're going to be just sitting there holding our base layer of Bitcoin being like, what's the big deal? You know, it's just going up. Everybody's becoming millionaires and billionaires that we know. Um, and and um, it's just it's so simple for us. But all these other layers are going to bring that those new layers of complexity and convenience. And people are going to eat that up like crazy. And it's thankfully built on a much better monetary network than is the U.S. dollar or any government fiat. We can't trust that. Right. I mean, who trusts what Powell's going to do and what, you know, the Treasury is going to do? We don't know what they're going to do. We don't really know, you know, their intentions other than they're going to debase. We know they're going to debase us. And so that's pretty crappy for a government to do to its people, I think. Um, and we know that Bitcoin will never debase us. So people will try to take advantage of the Bitcoin network for sure. I think even people in Bitcoin will get rug pulled because they're going to trust some entity. Uh, again, I'm not saying strike, but some company could come on and say, hey, yeah, we run on the Lightning Network. Yeah, you know, put money, put funds here and then they may walk away with your money. We just don't know. That stuff happens. People, there are people who are bad people who do stuff like that. And so the base layer, though, what, what I love and what you love is it can't be manipulated and altered and we can see what's going on. It's totally open source. So that's what makes it awesome. OK, that's the first point I want to talk about. And then you're talking about the stock market. And um, I, I think um, to your point in the future it's going to come down to there's going to be a division, a line in the sand for stocks. And, and I think it has already started. And I think that in the next decade, you either are pro Bitcoin and you, you're, you're pulling a micro strategy with your capital allocation decisions and you're, you know, borrowing cheap credit, cheap money to, to go long Bitcoin and you're putting it on your balance sheet or you have some sort of strategy like a square where people can buy and hold whatever Bitcoin on their portfolio. Um, or you're a Bitcoin miner, something where you have a Bitcoin strategy that's on this side, and then you don't have a Bitcoin strategy, you're anti-Bitcoin. The anti-Bitcoiners, and you could make an ETF of them right now, it's huge, it's almost everybody in the S&P 500. 
they are going to get that group is going to shrink both in market capitalization and the number of companies because thankfully some companies will figure it out a lot of companies will and they'll come over to the bitcoin side the ones that don't are going to shrink 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 and then become obsolete within probably a decade or so that sounds crazy to most people i tell that to but i say you do not understand exponential growth Bitcoin is growing exponentially. The network is, the value is. If you are not on it, the companies that are like MicroStrategy, literally if, so say, what's the biggest company? I think Microsoft just took out Apple or they're real close to each other around two and a half trillion. If they don't adopt a Bitcoin strategy, MicroStrategy will be bigger than Microsoft and Apple and it won't be that long from now and it's going to blow people's minds. And those companies, which right now seem like these huge behemoths that you can't stop, they're like a mountain, that you could never imagine crumbling. Microsoft will be big enough to buy those someday if they want to. Um, and so that's just how, that's what exponential growth does. And so uh, that's my significance I see in the stock market. You're either a pro Bitcoin company or you're not. You're either gonna th uh, thrive going into the future or you're gonna become obsolete. I don't totally even know agree. if that answered the original question. No, that that it does. It totally that's like that's exactly um I think the same way. And I'm thinking like like I look at Tesla for example and I'm going, "Look, I understand you guys do you know you you have a great revolutionary product on your hands, but look, you're over a trillion on your market cap right now. I would be doing secondaries left and right, getting 10, 20 billion together, buy 10 billion worth of Bitcoin. It would be bothering my ego tremendously if I was talking with Michael Saylor and seeing Michael Saylor get all this press and I'm Elon Musk who used to be involved in PayPal. You, it was actually x.com merged with Coinfinity, created PayPal, and his he, I've seen Elon Musk go on the record saying, "Oh yeah, that was just the email thing, the email payment thing they wanted so bad at eBay. Like we were like we just sold it to him because they wanted that. It wasn't even really the whole plan." I'm like, "What was the full plan then? What were you working on with Peter Thiel and the whole PayPal mafia over there? Like what was the what was the original plan, Elon? Because he tends to be pretty quiet and joke. He's all jokes and whatnot. But at the end of the day." Elon is a genius. Like nobody can deny it. You watch this guy on interviews and go, okay, this guy is a legitimate genius of our time. And he's got a bit of Bitcoin that's gone up in value a lot because I think his average price is like 33,000, 30 something thousand uh, when mm -hmm. Tesla got in. Um, but I'm just thinking to myself, how many companies are going to look at their rich valuations right now and not think to do a secondary? That just makes me laugh like the GameStop and the AMC crowd. It's like these, if they're smart, they're going to do secondaries at these ridiculous valuations. It's a movie theater. Of course, they, right. need to, they take the capital in, buy a bunch of new locations, get in the real estate game and play McDonald's games, you know, where you own the real estate and keep building more stuff on yep. it. So I, I just don't uh, how. How do you see that playing out? Just more and more companies that are the smart ones will do secondaries, gather up some funds, and then get into Bitcoin and start converting their balance sheets over. Uh, specifically, I'm curious about Tesla because Apple, I look at Apple right now and it's like they had the opportunity to buy Tesla for like $40 billion. Do you remember that? Elon yeah. Musk tried uh -huh. to get an interview with Tim Cook, and I bet you Steve Jobs is like, you idiot, what is wrong with you? You didn't go and take him up. They were, he built it in Fremont down the street mm -hmm. from him. They were in Palo Alto. It's like, I feel like Elon Musk's original vision was to get acquired by Apple, building it in Fremont and everything. And then when he realized that, oh, wait, we're going bigger than Apple anyway. We might as well just go to Tesla. I mean, go to, go to Texas. Uh, yep. So it's like, I guess <laughs> that's another long-winded uh, conversation right there, like topic. But I was curious, like, what do you, do you see more and more to add to what we were talking about with the stock market? More and more companies doing that, converting their balance sheets and doing secondaries, scooping up Bitcoin and holding it on their balance sheets. Sure. So, so capital allocation decisions have always been a fairly important role for CEOs and CFOs of companies. I think now in the age of Bitcoin, it's actually the most important role. So, you know, we talk about vision for, for the future and that's, that is obviously important. And can you manage your staff in the C-suite and all this kind of thing? Also very important. Michael Saylor is proving because of what Bitcoin is and because of its exponential growth that there is no more important decision than being a master capital allocator. And so that's just kind of the main thing I look for when I'm investing in different stocks. Um, there has never been a better time to do what Michael Saylor is doing. He's he's absolutely brilliant. He's he, the, the credit system is just out of control. It's so huge. And we have a Federal Reserve that's pushing us to do this kind of thing. They're, they they dropped interest rates to near zero. They're debasing the currency as fast as they can. Any almost anyone can get a loan. You know, obviously there's a there's a segment of the population, the poor population. They're really struggling. They're the ones who are suffering. They're the the ones paying the cost of every of all of this, which is awful. Again, which Bitcoin fixes, but but 
getting back to that, what Staler is doing, he's accessing cheap capital as much as possible, as often as possible, and just getting it into Bitcoin as soon as possible. And every CEO, CFO of every company should be doing the exact same thing right now. Every individual, this is not individual investment advice, but every individual should consider this and consider the math of doing that, right? If you can borrow at 2% or 4% or 6%, and put it into an asset that is growing at a 200% CAGR, even if that gets cut in half in the next 10 years to 100%, even if it gets you know cut by by 20 by 75% and it's only a 50% CAGR for the next 10 years, that's still really good math working in your favor. If you can gain 50% a year and only pay 6% a year, right? You're po you're pocketing the 44% difference. There's a little nuances to that, but that's about how it works. And so that's, to me, it's it, it was a brilliant move to start to see an actual CEO of a public company doing that. Um, now it's, I think, flipped over to just, it's absolutely foolish to not be doing that. And so when I see companies quarter after quarter not reporting Bitcoin holdings, not doing secondary offerings to, to borrow and, and uh, you know, to get money out of the market to put into Bitcoin, I think they're stupid and I think they're starting the road to obsolescence already. And some of them are going to figure it out sooner than others. And some of them never will because they're old and stodgy. And that's just how the world works. And we're, so we're seeing this capitalism in action and these, these uh, monetary decisions in action and the ones that don't, they're going to get eaten up and, you know, chewed up and spit out by companies like Microsoft, MicroStrategy, which Man, MicroStrategy, who had heard of MicroStrategy before Sailor did this? Nobody, right? I'm, I'm in the markets. I hadn't even heard of them. They were like a crappy tech company, no offense. Um, and and they're going to become one of the biggest companies. In the SM they may become the biggest company in the world because of their Bitcoin holdings. It's just astonishing. And so people are going to be writing about this in economics textbooks, if textbooks exist, or wh wherever, whatever they read 50 years from now. And they're going to look back and it's going to be for sure going to be a case study in what Michael Saylor did and how he started this whole movement onto the Bitcoin standard as a company. Uh, and then we're going to obviously El Salvador is going to be the country example uh, of getting onto the Bitcoin standard. So we just live in really exciting times and being pro Bitcoin, it's, it's so fun to be a part of this and to watch the infrastructure get built out in real time. It's, it's such an awesome answer, man. Um, I, I, I'm curious on something because this, this would actually answer, this would like go into the next question in a way. Um, if you had $10 billion under management right now with Veilshire, because there's so many people going, okay, the, mining, the, the thing that I'm interested in right now is like, I look at, there's like, it's almost like there's arbitrage plays out there. Like you're taking advantage of Grayscale right now because there's a discount. You look at mining stocks, some of them are trading at 7x multiples of what's on the Bitcoin on their balance sheets. Then you have things like, uh, you know, spot Bitcoin, you could just buy it up from the exchange or put it in your own cold storage or something along those lines. Or you you could you invest in like a miner or something like that. So it's like what what makes more sense because what Sailor has done and what what blows my mind with MicroStrategy is it's not even at a two x multiple of its Bitcoin position, which is a very strong Bitcoin position. When they have a lot of solvency, they could literally be an exchange or something like that in the future. They could do anything because they have so much solvency now. So we both believe in MicroStrategy on that. It's the only stock that goes it goes against my ethos to put money in the stock market, but I couldn't help myself but to get into MicroStrategy when we were talking about it. And I know you'd been in MicroStrategy much much before I even got into it. We just, we talked about it later on. And I think I got in around like, um, like mid sixes, low sevens range on micro strategy. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, where would you allocate $10 billion right now? If you had 10 billion boom, and you were in that position, similar to Michael Saylor, would you do the same thing that he did and just go straight into Bitcoin? Yeah. So it depends what hat I'm wearing. So as a hedge fund manager, which is kind of my primary role, I have a different take on things. So, so what I do in my hedge fund is I, I tend to think long term, but I make trades that tend to last for usually quarters or months long, sometimes years long. Um, even so, take Bitcoin. So everything's cyclical, right? Business cycles, stock prices, they ebb and flow. Um, if Bitcoin uh, say has a huge run up, say in the next two months, you know, where's what are we sitting at right now? Sixty one thousand. Maybe it runs up to 500,000 in the next two to uh, four or five months. It's possible. Um, I don't I, I don't know. It's possible. So say it does. So say it runs up to 500,000. That's a parabolic move higher. If it does that, there's, a, I think, an extremely strong chance that it's going to correct after that. 
when I run my hedge fund, what I try to do is hedge against those corrections so that my clients don't take that 80, 70, 80% drop in Bitcoin or whatever it is. I'm just, this is all hypothetical. My personal stash of, of Satoshis, I just buy and hold and I never plan on selling them. So I don't care what it does. So that's what I would actually recommend for the 99% of people out there. Just buy, hold it. It'll take care of you. You don't even need to, to think about it or worry about it. 10 years from now, it will change your life if, if you do this strategy. In my hedge fund, because I think like that, I would do hedging strategy. So right now, if you gave me 10 million in my hedge fund, I would do what you're talking about. I, I have a base position, a core allocation, about 50% of my fund is in just straight up Bitcoin because I look at that as just savings. And that is my hurdle rate. I have to try to outperform um, Bitcoin or at least maintain that level in my fund. Otherwise, there's no reason to be in it. Things that tend to outperform Bitcoin in the short term during bull markets. Yes, miners, uh, exchanges actually tend to do well. MicroStrategy, I think, outperforms. It's come down. So like it's sort of its premium to NAV has come down. That's why it's actually underperformed Bitcoin recently. I think if we go into a raging bull market that that premium will return um, because that's kind of a leveraged way to play Bitcoin. So I think that's also a good way if I feel like we've peaked and we're near the top of a cycle, I would turn around and hedge things. So what I like to do, the way I think about it is I want to defend my core Bitcoin position and I will sacrifice in the short term other players. So I would actually go short miners at that point. I would actually short MicroStrategy. Nothing against Michael Saylor. I don't want his company to go out and it won't go out of business. I just, I think it's a great way to hedge against the downside of Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin does drop, say 50, 60, 70%, and I'm, I keep my core position, I can sell short or buy puts on those kind of things. Uh, and that will really lessen the the losses and that can help, that can cause significant outperformance over time. So that's my strategy in my hedge fund. Uh, yeah, so that's that's what that's what I would do. I would I would put it all in right now because I think we are definitely set up for a huge move higher in the in the coming months. But then I would be prepared to kind of protect that position a little later. And I think that's that's Sailor's game theory in a way. It's like he's like get the solvency first, get the Bitcoin, and then let's ask questions later. You know. Yep. And I will tell you. So the difference between what I do. So what I love about Sailor, and I just I really love people because this is how I used to be is just a long-term hodler, like a Warren Buffett, your holding period is forever. Warren Buffett, by the way, and I would recommend this to people, if you just take out everything Warren Buffett says about stocks and how to trade and own and invest in stocks and the mentality you should have and the way you should think about it, if you just exchange stocks for Bitcoin, he's actually the best he gives the greatest wisdom on what to do with Bitcoin. You're buying, your holding period is forever, right? You, If you see it dip down, you just go, you ape in and then you forget about it and you never think about clearing it off of your balance sheet because you just think of it as this treasured possession on your balance sheet. He has his companies that used to be awesome. They're junky now, the American Express, Coke. I mean, they're they're okay companies now, but they were they're way past their prime. And that's what I think he has going against him is he holds on things too long because companies come and go and they'll be out of business 50 years from now. Bitcoin won't, right? This is a story that's going to last for centuries, possibly for millennia. This is just something you put on your balance sheet, whether it's in the, on your personal uh, your personal statement or your family's statement, and you pass it down for generations. Or on a company like what Sailor's planning on doing is uh, he's going to hold it in MicroStrategy's books, hopefully forever. The one catch with him, and this is what I want to tell people if people are thinking about investing in MicroStrategy, Michael Saylor is not going to live forever, right? So there's something could happen to him. He could he could die in a car accident tomorrow. And and so you have to trust that the strategy that he's employing right now is going to exist beyond him. So there's that risk that if something happens to him, or who knows, maybe he, he gets into altcoins and he starts thinking Solana is the place to be. It'll, probably never happened, but it could, right? People, we've seen crazier things. And so, so just remember that, that holding micro strategy is riskier than just holding Bitcoin straight up. So I would tell most people just hold Bitcoin. Don't worry about anything else. On that topic of all that you, after you've, cause people need to understand that you've done thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of research on Bitcoin. I mean, you, you care a lot about understanding it. You're not just going, you know, YOLO, I'm jumping in this Bitcoin position. You've done a lot of research why only Bitcoin? Because a lot of people watching my channel are very, very new to this. And I've taken, I've taken, I take it on both sides. I get one black eye on the right side, one black eye on the left side. You know, the silver guys and the gold guys, they're like, oh, how dare you Bitcoin? And the Bitcoins go, how dare you silver? Like, it's just, it's both sides of it. And so I get very new 
individuals to crypto. We call it, we see Bitcoin asset. We don't even really acknowledge cryptocurrency, but why that to you? What made you realize only Bitcoin? Sure, sure. So, so the two angles you brought up, first of all, to the gold and silver bugs out there. And I know I greatly respect your, uh, what you do. And I used to be a gold and silver bug myself. I, I used to look at gold as the solution to what the Fed is doing. It was, it was the best option we had to kind of opt out of um, the Fed's debasing of the currency over the long run. It did a super admirable job of being a stable store of value for thousands of years, which is incredible. Um, and so, but then when I started studying Bitcoin, you know, the thousands of hours, what I realized about Bitcoin is everything that gold offers, Bitcoin offers 10x that. It's every every benefit you're going to get from gold, you're going to get 10 times that with Bitcoin, maybe more than 10 times. And so to me, I kept weighing that. I'm like, well, I believe that gold will do well in this situation, but I think that Bitcoin is going to do 10 times, like literally 10 times better gain wise. So why would so why would I hold any of this? And 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 once you understand what Bitcoin is and its security and uh, its longevity uh, and the way it's decentralized and the way you can just own it for yourself uh, in cold storage and the self sovereignty of it, it kind of makes the the need it 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 uh, diminishes the need for gold. I think that we've been seeing the demonetization of silver, which used to trade, as you know, way better than me, used to trade about a one to 16 ratio with gold back in the late 1900s. Now it's a one uh, to 80 now, one to 75. <laughs> right. And, and I think that, so I didn't put this together until Bitcoin, but I think that silver was demonetized because it was no longer treated as money. And so it kind of got demonetized and became just a commodity. And it has applications as a commodity. It has value as a commodity. I think gold, and, I, and you've, you've talked about this too, and again, you're, you're the expert on this, but gold, I think we're starting to already see it become demonetized and we're gonna view it in the future. 10 years from now, I think gold is just a commodity that kills the gold bugs, it kills Peter Schiff. But I just think that um, that's what it's, we'll see it as the, for the utility of it and maybe for the beauty of it, um, but not anymore as money. And that's because I think Bitcoin, again, for everything gold does, Bitcoin does 10x better. So why not just own Bitcoin? You had a second part of your question. Um, well, uh, that's part of it. That's part of it too. Like the, the, that's actually the funny thing is a lot of people like they get mad at me too. Cause I'm not a big gold bug myself. I, I, I think if people think, cause I own mineral exchange that I'm a big gold bug. I'm actually big on industrial precious metals and collectibles. I, I think that you had a, I mean, even like Rolexes, for example, went up like a hundred percent through all of this when mm -hmm. they're printing more and more money. It's like the, if you want a tangible, go after something that is either limited and as a collectible or you want to go after something that's actually being used in industry. So palladium has been in a six year deficit. They don't have enough palladium to meet the demand. So why would, if, if I have the option of being in a precious metal, why would I not go for the one that is being eaten up by industry and the supply isn't there to meet the demand? Why would I go to the one that has a ton of it in the vaults, not just any vaults, but the central bank's vaults? They got plenty of it. So how is that going to get them to change? That's not going to give the people in leverage over the powers that be. They have all of it. They have All you got to do is look up Queen of England gold vault and you'll see the queen walking through this crazy vault of gold that she has over there and nobody knows what the real market cap is of gold either there's no way to really audit the any gold dealer in the country all the top gold dealers in the country that i know you could tell them you know they found out that there's 30 trillion worth of gold there's actually not 12 trillion there's 30 trillion above ground none of them would be surprised because none of us know how to audit it no there's no like ledger to check uh mm -hmm. we just are trusting that this is some number of amount of gold and every all the gold bugs can't deny that peter schiff can't deny that nobody can deny that we do not know the real market cap of gold uh so there's so many things about gold that i don't agree with and i would much rather be in silver platinum palladium rhodium uh and the other thing is like look at their chart look at palladium's chart look at rhodium's chart for example like w these metals are performing right now if you wanted to be in a precious metal these are actual performing precious metals that nobody's talking about mm -hmm. i don't understand why peter schiff doesn't talk about them maybe he just it doesn't fit his narrative but it's like and that's why i bet he won't debate me at some point because i would bring up these points i'm like if i have the option of being in precious metals why gold's the last option i would want there's the most of it is it's already above ground sitting in vaults we have a huge market cap that's a hard needle to push you know it's like or it could be in the one that are less than a trillion so it's like when it comes to precious metals, that's my view on it. I believe in industrial precious metals and collectibles much more so than I do in gold. 
uh, if, if I believe in gold at all, I don't hold gold myself really on my balance sheet. I have like collectible pieces, but I don't like my watch or like an old cool bar, like a Rothschild bar or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't hold it on my own sheet. But what I was curious about is why only Bitcoin? Uh, and so you answer oh, for metals, yeah. but but against altcoins and stuff too sure. as well. So I, lo- I this comes up every day on Twitter Spaces, right? When people bring people come into the room and we start only because this, this is a to- whole new audience here yes. on YouTube, because right? there yes. everybody here is like not on most of them aren't on Twitter, you know, so it's right. like, they'd be really curious on this answer because a lot of them say, yeah. oh, I can afford three Ethereum. I only got 10,000 to invest in and they don't even know that you can own a fractional amount of Bitcoin. You know, it's crazy. So, so yeah, so absolutely. So, so to your point, what, what I tell people whenever they come up and start talking about this is I say, Bitcoin is not crypto. Okay. Crypto, it, it, it was the original crypto currency, but the way the the modern vernacular has taken the term crypto, Bitcoin is not crypto. There's Bitcoin and then there is everything else. Bitcoin has won the contest of being the world's best money. It just, it's the apex money that this was a battle that was um, fought back in 2017, 2018 for people who, have, who know about it long enough. There was a hard fork. There, there was Bitcoin cash. People were debating, you know, the merits. Should we be more of a store of value? Do we want to be a better medium of exchange? What did Satoshi really mean when he, was, when he wrote in his white paper these things? And all these other competitors, Litecoin, um, you know, the Ethereum classic is, is, was kind of considered a currency sort of back then. The current one, Shiba Inu, Doge, blah, blah, blah. The market has clearly decided, in my mind at least, that Bitcoin has won. And Bitcoin has all of the properties to be the base layer of the new world's financial monetary order there's 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 really it's already one it's sort of like the internet that we use today it's one the protocol there's not going to be another internet a, a, a silver to the to the in, current gold internet because it's 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 the lead dog it already won the race it's so far ahead of everything else that to me it's not even worth talking about it's just better money okay then we talk about the altcoins 98 percent of all the other altcoins to me are basically just technology protocols that trade like venture capital little or angel investing type companies they are marked to market so you can see a move 24 7 365 that's what's really enticing to people they are all technology protocols that may or may not exist five ten years from now i think most of them won't i think of these as so i think of bitcoin over here as this store of value this new money that's like a burning coal that's just going to burn forever it's like the sun basically and then over here you have these little things that are like striking a match they flare up they get really hot for a couple days or weeks or even months elon touts them you know mark uh um, mark Mark cuban cuban thank you cuban touts them somebody touts them and they go up a thousand percent and everybody gets rich and celebrates and talks about how it's way better than bitcoin and then they flare out and they go to zero. And that's just what these things do. They don't add value to the world. Um, they're, they're there, again, similar to venture capital. And, and God bless those guys. They, they do what they do. And some of them are in there for good purposes. Most of them are there for the exit strategy. They get in. They all jump in together, all of these huge VC firms. They shoot the value of this investment up a thousand X, 10,000 X, and then they exit and they get out and they leave regular people holding the bag. And then the regular people hold the bag and the value goes down or it's, or it's sucked out all the value. So all it does is like trade flat for the next several years. That's their strategy. And that's what these altcoins are for the most part. They're just a a sort of a clever idea with a good marketing campaign. Um, And, and they're, but they're, there's very little substance to them, if any, and most of them are no substance. So no substance eventually goes to zero value. So that's how I feel about most of the altcoins. Like you can speculate in that stuff if you want to. And that's the other thing. I'm in a different camp than a lot of people. I get in trouble with some of the hardcore Bitcoin maxis because I'm like, I don't care if you speculate in that stuff. If there are always going to be gamblers in this world, people love to gamble. I, I'm not going to walk into a Las Vegas casino and tell people they're stupid for playing blackjack or that you're stupid for playing the roulette or whatever game you're going to play because clearly the odds are against you. The house always wins. What are you doing? You're so stupid. You know what? They're going to do what they're going to do and they're, they want to be there and they do that. That's great. Some of them are going to get wrecked. That's their deal. It's not my deal. I, if they want to learn about sound money, here I am. I'll tell you, I'll talk your ear off all day about Bitcoin. If you want to go gamble and you want to go play the lottery, I'm not going to go to 7-Eleven and stop you from buying a lottery ticket because that's your prerogative. It's a free world. It's a free market. 
go do it. Maybe you'll win. And if that's what I tell people, like, you know, I know people who have just made a ton of money on Doge or Shiba Inu or whatever token. I'm like, that's awesome. Good for you. Make sure to save in Bitcoin. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Like if you're not, if you are not increasing your stack of Satoshis, you're not winning. You just kind of like won a little lottery. You're going to fritter it away and it's going to go to zero if, if you're not careful. So take your earnings. Thank God for them. Put it into Bitcoin and move on with your life. That's kind of my take on those. They're just gambling and speculation. And I'm not going to, they're all, and I do believe they're always going to be with us because speculators are always going to speculate. People love to be entertained. People want to do collectibles. So those, the whole NFT craze, uh, I think is just like the baseball cards of the past and football cards and whatever collectible things. That's going to be its own thing. I don't care. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin. Do that if you want to. But if you want to learn about sound money, uh, I'm here. To, I'm here to talk to you about sound money. Love it. Love it. It's like if there's if there's one thing to be a maximalist about, like I'm in only Bitcoin. Some people would say that's a Bitcoin maximalist, but I, I guess not because I have other things than Bitcoin, but I'm only in Bitcoin when it comes to crypto. But when it when I look at what what I'd be a maximalist about, I want to be a maximalist about capitalism. I want to be a mm-hmm. maximalist about being in a free market capitalistic environment. That's what I want to be a maximalist about. And I, yep. I want to see that continue to, because I know that's the only solution. We've tried all the other methods in the past in the history of humans. You know, we've tried socialism. We tried communism. We tried all these different things. Capitalism is the only one that works. So that's the thing to be a maximalist about. And it's like, if, if anything, what I'm noticing and you're saying, and when you say put your profits in Bitcoin, all of these traders that are in other altcoins, they they tend to do that. And they, that's like the hidden little thing they don't like to talk about. They're like, they're like, oh, I made all this money on Shiba Inu. But they don't allow you to leverage on Shiba Inu, do they? They don't have a collateralized loan basis for that. That's actually by a large institution, do they? Because what you're going to do is you're going to sell to a greater fool. You're there, you're going to take that profit and they're going to go put it in Bitcoin and then they're never going to have to pay a capital gain on their Bitcoin position because now you have things like Coinbase is even doing it. And that's something I want to talk about next is these collateralized loans. So people in Bitcoin that are accumulating and saving in Satoshis, like you're saying, they can then leverage their Bitcoin position to get a fiat if they want hot potato money. I call it hot potato money because uh, every wealthy person I know looks at dollars like they're hot potatoes, you know, and just, oh yeah, boom, there, boom, there. Yep, yep. And uh, so it's like, but now that that's like a total mind shift. And I plan to make a video specifically on this topic because you can legally not pay taxes on your Bitcoin by say you have a million dollars in Bitcoin or you started at a hundred K and now it's a million dollars worth of Bitcoin. You can take that million, give it to an institution. Coinbase is now doing it. I don't really trust them as much as I trust the ones like on chain. We can get into that as well, but um, then you can give them the million, get a five hundred thousand dollar loan. They'll give you fifty percent against it. So they'll wire you five hundred k into your bank account. You now have five hundred thousand of free spending capital. You can then pay it once you pay off that loan. They will give you the exact amount of Bitcoin that you gave them. Not a, it doesn't change with the market. You get the exact amount back, so that you get the upside of the Bitcoin and you can leverage it. And in that time, you got the free cash flow and you never had to pay a capital gain tax. So that is why people want to actually save in Satoshis and what you are talking about. How do you feel about that collateralized loan basis? And you plan to use that with Veilshar in the future? So I think that's a great idea. I also think it's inevitable. So we've been talking about this for a while too uh, w- with you on, on Spaces. So so the whole idea of a HELOC, so people just so people get caught up. So a HELOC is a home equity line of credit. I think the future is BLOC, so Bitcoin lines of credit. And they're coming. They're, they're already here. Uh, and But I think they're going to be like basically ubiquitous within a couple of years. Even traditional banks, little community banks are going to start offering this. I think, by the way, that that's part two. So part one, I think what people should, I think what makes more sense if you're starting out in this space or if you've been in this space for a little bit, but you don't have quite the stack of Satoshis that you're hoping for yet, is to take advantage of what we were talking about, the sailor strategy. So access cheap fiat markets. What you want to do is borrow in depreciating a depreciating asset and put it into an appreciating asset like Bitcoin. If you can do that and kind of game the system, Again, not individual investment advice. Every person is different. Every situation is different. Mathematically, that makes a ton of sense. If you can borrow and you only have to pay uh, 3% or 5% or whatever, 8% interest rate here, and you can put it into an asset that's increasing at 50, 100%, 200% per year, it's just very mathematically smart to consider doing that. That's step one. Say you do that and or you don't, but you you eventually get a stack of Bitcoin like you're talking about that's sizable, that now it's 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 comparable to like a house. You have a hundred thousand dollars in equity, like of just solid straight up Bitcoin, or maybe a million dollars worth. Let's call it a million because that that the numbers get easier. 
yeah, you can do the whole concept of buy, borrow, die. Um, so that's this is what wealthy people do. Wealth. The reason why everybody gets all uptight about this, the reason why wealthy people don't pay much taxes is because they have crazy uh, valuable assets. Their net worth is huge. And all they do is borrow against that. And when you borrow against it, the way the U.S. tax laws work is you almost never pay tax. In fact, you get tax um, credits. You get rebates for borrowing money. Um, it's kind of like if you own a house, the mortgage payments, you actually get um, tax credits for that. And so, so when people borrow against, say, their Bitcoin holdings, not only are they not paying taxes, instead of paying like 40 or 45 percent tax rates, depending on what state you live in, when you include federal and state, um, instead of paying that, you may just be paying the borrowing rate of 8 or 10 percent or whatever, you know, whoever you're borrowing from. The asset that you own, the Bitcoin, say it's a million dollars this year, if it's still growing at 100 percent CAGR, 100 percent per year, that means after year one, it now it's up to $2 million worth of Bitcoin and you have to pay back that loan, but you can roll that loan over because you're rolling it against this asset that's now $2 million. The next year, it goes up to $4 million, and you can roll that over, but it's still at such a slower rate. Sorry, I'm trying to get my hands on the screen here and it's backwards, but you know what I'm saying? So your asset is growing so much faster than your borrowing rate that you can actually technically, possibly, conceivably do this for the rest of your life. Then when you die, that's part three, buy, borrow, die. You can live off this until you die. When you die, depending on how you work it, there's lots of different legal structures, but it could be as simple as your kids have to, they, they, they take that lump sum of Bitcoin you have left, they take a chunk of that and pay off the loan over here. And then the rest of that they get to keep and you pass on your Bitcoin. And that's just kind of traditional ways. There are much sneakier ways or more uh, wiser ways maybe would be the way to put it that you can do little loopholes through trusts and estates and things like that so that you pay even less taxes on it. So that's the whole buy, borrow, die concept. You first though, what a lot of people don't get, you have to build up your Bitcoin asset so that it's big enough so that you actually can borrow against it. And one final point, I don't recommend that you have a loan to value of even close to 50%. I think because if you do that, you're risking the chance that if Bitcoin is, it's still very volatile. If it drops 50 or more percent, they're going to take your Bitcoin from you as collateral because that's how the agreement works. So I recommend not, not borrowing more than 25% as an absolute max. I would do more in the five to 10% range. So if you can't live off of five to 10% of your Bitcoin, you don't have enough Bitcoin yet. Keep working, keep building it. And then someday maybe you'll get there. And then when, because if Bitcoin continues to grow exponentially, you'll get there sooner than later. Um, and then when you can, you can think about employing this strategy. That's a very interesting point. I actually haven't heard someone bring that up yet, that they, that rather than doing it. And what do you mean by that is, so if I give them a million, instead of taking the full, because what they'll do to protect themselves, they'll only give you 50% against your original investment. So if I give them a million worth of Bitcoin, they will give me 500K at maximum. They won't give me any more than 500K. That's the maximum mm -hmm. they will give me. You're saying that I should choose to go for less and only take, you know, a hundred grand or something against my million. Because then what's interesting about what you just said and what clicks in my mind from being being in, I leverage all the time in precious metals. So I'm, I'm constantly doing financing and stuff like that. In that situation, they have so their, their risk mitigation is so high for them. Like there's so there's such little risk in that scenario because they have more than 90%, only 10% at risk. They would have to give you a much more, uh, like a easy, a better interest rate on that capital. So I would imagine, do you see that being like a sliding scale? If I give yes. them X amount of my Bitcoin, they hold my Bitcoin I would, instead of paying 10% a year for this loan, I might pay them 5% or 4% or maybe mm -hmm. even less, 2 3, 3% uh, yep. because they, own, I, they have so much of my capital. Right. So it's always better to be conservative in these kind of things. So the more conservative your loan, the better rates you'll probably get the and the much lower chance you'll have of losing your Bitcoin. Because like, so say you're only borrowing, so say you have a million, you borrow a hundred thousand, that's a 10% loan to value. That means the price of Bitcoin can drop 90% and you're still not at risk of them taking your Bitcoin from you um, as like as a margin call. And so that has a ton of safety to it. And so that to me, that's better in every way. You're paying less for interest payments, you have almost no risk of losing your Bitcoin and you can keep that up then for years and years to come, possibly decades. Is there any collateralized loan spaces that you trust currently that you would want to do this with as of now? Because we're obviously seeing competition coming out now that Coinbase is in the in the game. They're a publicly traded entity now. I mean, like that's I don't think Gemini is publicly traded. A lot of them aren't publicly traded. So you got a publicly traded entity, a ton of money on their balance sheet. 
they now are in that collateralized loan space. This is a very recent, uh, I think within like the last week they announced this. Mm -hmm. yep. So they're going to be competing now. So it's like, is it the play to wait a while until competition is at max velocity and then go, okay, now I can take advantage of this. Yeah. So I've dug into this a little bit. I don't personally do this by the way yet, but I wouldn't be opposed to considering it, but I'm, so I'm interested and I love, like I said, I just enjoy watching the infrastructure get built out and then watching the competition because competition is good for us as consumers. So what I see happening right now, most loans, if you're doing like a 50% loan to value, BlockFi, Coinbase, um, some other ones, um, Celsius is another one that does that. And there's, I'm sure there's a lot more that are sort of in that, in the same genre of companies they're about eight to ten percent for that kind of loan but if you as you go down now the lowest one i've seen is actually a company called celsius they if you do a 25 percent loan to value that's a one percent interest rate which is pretty astonishing so that got my attention and so I'm, i've been looking into that and trying to figure out how they even can swing that but basically they're they're playing that game there it's it's it reminds me kind of of what jack is doing with strike they know that interest rates are going to come down so they're just going to be like the loss leader right off the bat and they're going to set the bar right here really low uh, and see if coinbase and these other ones will come down to them it's a great way to draw in business that's what I would do. I would look for the best. So obviously a stable company, if you can figure out what a stable company in this world is, um, the lowest um, interest rates. I like ones that where they promote, they want you to do conservative loan to values. That means they tend to have your best interests in mind. I don't like co uh, companies that offer 50% loan to value because those people are going to get wrecked almost certainly. I think at some point we're going to see another 50 plus percent drawdown. And we just saw one back in April, May. We're going to see another one, and that's going to wreck the people that have these loans out that think they're they're they have a safe like a margin of safety. I don't think they do. Um, so I, I'm looking for companies more and more to to come out with this, and I think we'll see that by the way as banks uh, come out with these kind of loans again that you have issues with custodianship and and who holds your Bitcoin and who's really sovereign. Are you really sovereign in that case? Probably not. Um, but I think that they will have conservative loan to values and and lower and lower rates. So. Um, Coming back to your question, I would wait. I would wait a little bit longer. Um, if, if you're interested in that, maybe check out that Celsius company. I, I can't say good or bad if it's a good company, if it's a trustworthy company, but I've just heard that they have low rates. Yeah, it's, it's in like the lower the rate and that's that's the biggest scare in the in the community I've noticed is where they go well if the the rates are low that means they're locating the Bitcoin behind the scenes and so but like what, what I think in my mind is is there a safe way that they could be locating the Bitcoin behind the scenes that's obviously the safest way is what uh, on and chain does where it just stays in the same thing you get a multi-sig type situation but I'm curious like if there is a possible way for them to do that that is safe because every time we've trusted some like a bank all of these banks are pretty much insolvent right now you know because mm -hmm. we trusted them so it's like if we do that it's kind of it's kind of the definition of insanity because we're doing the same thing over <laughs> and over and expecting a different result right. sort of thing but uh, I wonder if you have like a bitcoin uh, like a bitcoiner that's in charge of one of these that actually has found a way to locate the capital so that 1% actually does make sense to them because obviously it doesn't make sense just if they were sitting on the bitcoin they have to be doing something behind the scenes right. cuz that 1% like they're, they're not making enough there. They have to be doing something with that Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And then I know there are solutions. And again, I'm not an expert at all on this and I haven't done the research yet, but there's some multi-sig solutions that are just purely Bitcoin based. Um, I think it's Unchained Capital. Unchained is, is one out of Texas over there. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So again, but I, I don't know any more than that, but if you want to do like, to me, that's the safest for sure way to do it because you're still basically maintaining at least partial custody of your Bitcoin. The rates are not going to be as good because you're paying for that safety. Um, but that's just another option. So I just enjoy watching this whole thing um, sprout up and it's going to become increasingly prevalent. I think it's just going to be like, we're not even going to blink an eye. It's like if somebody tells you about a HELOC that they have, you don't even blink an eye or bat an eye. Um, I think B locks are going to be like that within four to five years. It's so crazy as you start like un going through layers and layers of Bitcoin and learning more and more about it, it just gets more and more surprising what it can do. You know, because mm -hmm. I thought I'm, when right. I first looked at Bitcoin, when I tried to put myself into my brain, you know, two years ago, I just thought of it as like a stock in a way. You're like, oh, yeah, I buy the stock. It sits in the exchange. You buy it at Coinbase or whatever, and it just sits there. It's just this digital thing. And But then when you realize, oh, wait, no, 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 this has real utility here. And if, mm -hmm. if you if people don't want to admit that being able to take custody of it in your own custody is not a utility, being a reserve bank is not a utility, they're just lying to themselves. And, if, mm -hmm. and if, you, if people want to say that you leveraging this asset, which you currently can do, this is not a hypothetical 
critical. You can currently leverage it. And another thing is if you, so that's utility number two, utility, best utilities that you can be your own bank. Second best utilities that you can leverage it. And then the third utility is that you can actually use it as payments and buy things with it. And, you, and people that say, oh, that's not true. Like Peter Schiff, well, then go to El Salvador, walk into a Starbucks. And that's the next thing I wanted to ask you is like, these are major companies here in, in El Salvador and they're being forced to learn how to accept Bitcoin. So you literally can go into a McDonald's. There's people that were posting it on Twitter and whatnot that mm -hmm. they actually bought their McDonald's with Satoshis. And it's not like it's a only an El Salvador company. That's McDonald's. That's the real deal. That's that's the actual yeah. company. So now mm -hmm. that's that they have a tech team in the States probably going, hey, we got to figure this this out. You know, like, how do yeah. we do this? Uh, so I'm just like. Does that kind of blow your mind on how this is rolling out in El Salvador? You see like more, um, and like as a second question to that, do you see the the, co the countries around El Salvador getting jealous of all the money that's going to start getting put into El Salvador with that three Bitcoin thing? I thought the three Bitcoin was, you know, uh, I had to pay them the three Bitcoin to get a permanent residency over there. No, I just have to invest three Bitcoin right. and I could build a business over there. I could buy a beach house over there. And I'm now a permanent resident of El Salvador. I have another residency I mean, they're going to be like Dubai if at this rate, you know, is yeah. they're, they're, and, and on top of it, their Bitcoin position is going up in value, which is insane. Yeah, they're doing everything right. I mean, they're they're acting like a smart company. They're like a micro strategy. Right. They're they they see this asset. They see the value it has. They see that it's, it's sort of like standing in a room at a, maybe a bus station and looking around and there's a hundred dollar bill over in the corner and everyone's kind of looking at it, but nobody's doing anything. And El Salvador, the whatever, Bukele, he's like, oh, I'm going to go pick it up. And he walks over and he grabs it and puts it in his pocket. Like, to me, that's literally what this is. It's And Michael Saylor is doing the same thing. It's, it's this thing sitting out here. It's this treasure. And it's so blatantly obvious, the benefits that you get from switching to this Bitcoin standard in this and, and working the system, the current fiat system, to favor you accumulating more Bitcoin. Anyone can do it like oh, almost anybody has access to the capital markets, to credit, to banks, to get to, to converting, to working, to doing your work at whatever fiat job you have, to converting your money, your fiat into Bitcoin and to start saving with this new technology that actually appreciates your purchasing power over time. Anyone can do it and still almost nobody is. And even the people who are doing it, who are into Bitcoin, they're only on phase one or, or two. So they, they, they've gotten out of this, the uh, skeptical stage and now they're speculating in it because they, they see people making a lot of money. So they're, they're just speculators, they're just gambling in it. Or possibly they've done like 100 hours of reading and now they're investors and they see that, oh, it's a good part of a diversified portfolio. Maybe I'll own some Bitcoin. That's great. They're still on their journey and they don't realize that yet, but they need to get to the, you know, the final stage of Bitcoin is savings. It's just the better, it's the best money. And so they, they, they realize that all I have to do is put my stuff into Bitcoin and work for Bitcoin or, you know, borrow money for Bitcoin. And then I, it opens up an entirely new world. That's so much better than the current fiat system we're in um, for all the reasons we've already discussed. So yeah, I see the thing these guys are doing and I'm like, bravo to you guys. And it, it, what does it come down to? Conviction and then having the courage to do it. And most people lack both of those things because they don't take the time to get educated. So they don't have the conviction and then even if they do, some people are just scared. I know people who like kind of buy into it. I've talked to them a bunch about Bitcoin. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Somebody I heard Buffett called it, said it was rat poison squared. And I, yeah, I like Buffett and he's really a good guy. And, you know, he's kind of like a grandpa, you know, I mean, stuff like that. Or I heard it's used by criminals, so I'm not sure. So they just, they lack the, the conviction and they lack the courage to get into it. So the people who are the first movers, are going to be at the forefront of this new monetary world order. And it's it's uh, for sure going to be a much better world as far as I'm concerned. Do you see countries around El Salvador going, you know, we got to do this too now. I mean, this is, this sure. is obviously working for them. Yeah, because people talk to people and they're going to start seeing. And again, this is just a great case. It's like a live experiment of this whole cohort, this population of El Salvadorans and the countries around them are going to look and they're like, wow, they don't have to go to Western Union to get their remittance payments. They don't have thugs beating them up on the way home and taking 50% of their money or, or they get beat up um, de dealing with, you know, driving two hours to go to, to get their payments. They don't have to, you know, pay with... Um, uh, borrow money from these banks and get get hosed for 20% interest rates. 
they all of these things and they're going to see and and it's just what happens if you start saving and we talked about this on again on spaces yesterday since el salvador switched over to making bitcoin legal tender i believe it's in the ballpark of bitcoin has it's been volatile for sure elizabeth warren is right it's volatile but it's more volatile to the upside and their purchasing power has increased by about 33 percent since they switched that's just since early september 33 percent for people who are used to currency getting worth less and less and less every year now they have more purchasing power than they did just a couple of months ago and that's that that's how bitcoin it's just math it's going to continue indefinitely for these people so it's it's uh, other countries around them are going to start to notice el salvador is going to become a wealthy country i'm interested in going to check it out i want to go i would think about investing in there i would love to have citizenship there i'd love to bring my family there and i and i think we're going to watch this become just this who even had thought of el salvador a year ago not a single person and now people are talking about going there it's going to become a destination location it's going to maybe become like a new hawaii or a new caribbean country for people to go vacation for people to go live in so yeah th there are definitely first mover advantages the, the the prize goes to the courageous and, and el salvador is is definitely at the forefront of that it's almost like we're going towards a world that will be more international like shipping made us be more international instead of being stuck in our own countries I, I see a world in the future where like it just makes so much sense to have a, a base layer that everyone agrees on being money like the whole I think we'll look back on it in time and go wait 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 we had CAD and USD and euros and yen and and, and yuan and all these different Australian dollar like and they all traded at different valuations and they all were different on the basket and one of them could print theirs to oblivion and the other one didn't get to print it as much and they all were back to nothing and they were all somehow held value and traded against each other and there was like currencies moving around it's like we'll probably look at that and, and just think oh, that is so stupid yeah like we for sure will yep it's we're just gonna crazy. just think this was just the craziest system it's just completely man-made i mean it fiat right it's just it only has value because the government says it has value and if you don't believe it here comes the u.s military to enforce that it, it does have value and this is like yes yeah, in the future we're going to look back at that and just be like we were insane what were we thinking what do you think bitcoin does in the because i i tend to be excited about the arbitrage of these fiats that of of bitcoin and these fiats being around it's like almost like they're going to get tokenized in a way like they're just going to be the altcoins of the world mm -hmm. and bitcoin being the main main place to store your money and then you go okay well you're not treating me right in your dollar you've overprinted it it's diluted my milk my ice cubes melting away in your dollars your banks don't even pay me an interest rate to compensate for the inflation you created yourself at the central bank like we this is ridiculous i'm not keeping my money in dollars i'm putting it into bitcoin do you see them just going like the whole, cause they always say the dollar is the cleanest shirt of the dirty hamper. I've said it a million times. We've heard that line a million times. Do you see that whole hamper falling at the same time? Or do you see the dollar shining for a while? Like how, how do you see that currency basket weighing out in the future? Sure. So I think the currencies, uh, I don't think they all fall at once. I think the strongest will survive the longest. So um, I think we will start to see one by one currencies getting picked off. So like, you know, in Turkey and other countries that are experiencing inflation and hyperinflation, they're going to, they're just going to, people are going to look at that. They're going to look at Bitcoin here and they're going to look at their currency that's hyperinflating. And they're like, why in the world would I hold this hyperinflating currency? That's just burning up in my hand. I'm going to put it into Bitcoin as fast as possible. Uh, and, and so the weakest, it's going to go from weakest to strongest. I think we're going to have in the coming years, we're going to have sort of this hybrid model. I, I use the analogy of like a hybrid vehicle. It's going to be part electric, part uh, internal combustion. And it's not going to really do either uh, both of them are not going to work very well. It's going to be just kind of this goofy system where basically Bitcoin will be the store of value and whatever government fiat remains will be the medium of exchange. But then people are going to realize, well, we have the Lightning Network and we can do things even easier, as easy or easier than the current system for a medium of exchange. Why wouldn't we just have just Bitcoin? And then we shift over into Bitcoin. But that's going to take a lot of time, right? There are people who Tons of people, the vast majority of people still don't believe it. They still don't understand Bitcoin. They still make fun of it for all the wrong reasons. You know, they have everything wrong about Bitcoin. We have to shift all of that public perception over to Bitcoin and to the Bitcoin standard before that happens. I don't know how fast it's going to. I do think it's going to not take as long as most people think, though. Um, again, because of the exponential growth, that moves really fast, faster than even my mind can keep up with. And so I, I would not be surprised if we're on some form of Bitcoin standard throughout most of the world by 2025, 2026. It sounds crazy now, but with the adoption rate doubling every year, that's kind of the pace we're on right now. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be very exciting, and it's going to be just absolutely 
shockingly, mind-blowingly in a negative way for all of the, you know, the detractors, the Peter Schiff's, the Elizabeth Warren's, the Steve Hankey's, the Paul Krugman, the, these just goofy, goofy people who don't see what's happening right under their noses. They're going to be uh, very disappointed with the future, I think. Greg Foss really nails them all at the same time because it's so easy. Like cause it's so it's so easy for us to get into a headbutting match, but it's it's hard to like systematically destroy their argument. And mm-hmm. to systematically destroy their argument for me, but what I saw for from not from me from Greg, I saw and I watched him do it. When he goes, you know, it's just you're all terrible risk managers. You're terrible risk managers, all of yeah. you. You know, and so that comes yeah. right from his. He knows all about the credit swabs and all the like the credit markets and everything, and and risk trading and everything like that. And so for him to go and look at it and take his expertise and go, you're just terrible risk managers, all of you. Peter Schiff, you you you, were, you if you in your Euro Pacific fund or whatever, if you had put a five percent allocation to Bitcoin, you would have been the best gold fund in the entire world if you had just been a good risk manager. But you're just a bad risk manager. It is what it is, Peter. Sorry. You know, it's like, oh god, right. that pain, the pain of that, because because I'm I'm living proof of that. You know, if I was yeah, my sure. I, I'm my own risk manager, and my risk management was, oh, I'll get a ten percent position in Bitcoin, and now that position is more than fifty percent of my net worth, which is mm-hmm. insane to me to think about. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. uh, it, it that's the best way to systematically destroy their arguments. Um, it's just going to be. I'm I'm fascinated to see how this unfolds, and I'm just I'm lucky to have friends like you in the space where I just am constantly learning from being in these uh, these Twitter spaces thing is just rolled out. And that's like another technological leap. These are all mm-hmm. things because we're learning so much at a way more rapid pace where college and stuff is becoming outdated because it's like, am I going to drive yeah. an hour out of my way? to So I waste an hour of my day to drive to the college. Then I go and sit 30 minute intervals to learn when I could learn faster on my own by downloading an audible book or something like that. It's like, and I could just stay at home and learn at a way more that hour is wasted that I drove and all these different things. And so I think about the way we're learning now and the technical technological leaps. I mean, we're do, doing this interview, not even in the same room, which is like all of these different things that we have now is just completely changing how fast we learn things. So right. when you talk about this happening sooner than later, I totally agree with that because this information, people are watching this video right now. Is they're not in a college class? They're just learning this on their own by watching this video. Mm-hmm. And so it's like when you add the technology that we have now in today's day and age, which really this happened in like 2007 to 10. Like it's really not that old, you know, the iPhone came out itself in 2007. So we have 13, 14 years of this rapid technology, technological growth. We have supercomputers in our pockets now. Um, If this could happen, you know, way faster than people expect. Um, Yeah. So it's just, if it's, it's time to be a good risk manager. If you're watching this, not financial (laughs) advice, you know, we have to say that in the video disclaimer, none of the, none of the stuff myself or Jeff is saying in here is, is financial advice. So disclaimer, but this is just our opinions. Um, but be a good risk manager. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to get somebody. Yeah. That's a great way to end it. I I agree. Do your own research. Like, please do your own research. Please don't wait much longer. I have lots of friends who I've, I've been talking about this, since it was in the hundreds of dollars, you know, and when it like, back in March of 2020, when it dipped below 5,000, I was like begging my good friends, like, please just buy a little bit, just a dollar's worth a $5, put a little skin in the game. So you, so you have a reason to like, to your point, you have a reason to study it and to protect it. Once you have a little bit of skin in the game, just put a little bit of skin in the game and then start your, you know, going down the rabbit hole, start your own educational journey, start doing your own research. And then you'll finally come around to see what it is and just simply see that it's just better money. You you really don't have to come to any more deeper conclusions than that. And it will be transformative to you and to your family and to future generations. If you reach that conclusion, hopefully sooner than later. Awesome. Jeff, where can people find you online? So on your Twitter, your Twitter handles at Jeff, uh, Jeff Ross. well, so the hand uh, the handle is at Valeshire Cap. Um, Cap but yeah. yeah, you can just look up Dr. Jeff Ross. I keep the doctor on there because there's a comedian with the same name as me. So I keep just, you know, to distinguish us. Um, otherwise, you can go to my website, Valeshire.com. Um, and I, I like to email. So if you ever have questions and you just want to ask about what I do at Valeshire, um, feel free to email me directly. You can do that at info at Valeshire.com. And I will put all that information in the description down below. So if you want a quick link to Valeshire.com, uh, it's down in there in the link below. And I'll also put your Twitter handle and all of the other information down there in the description. So make sure to check that out. Uh, if you're not following Jeff on Twitter and following what he does in this space, you think you're really doing yourself a disservice. So I highly recommend doing that. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for spending so much time here. I think people will really, really benefit from this. Thanks, Rob. I had a great time. It's really fun talking to you. You know so much about so many things. So I love anytime we get to talk. Yeah, I appreciate you, man. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, you too.